Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Lemick. I'm the founder of the Wounded Workforce organization dedicated to building trauma-informed workplaces. And this is our first in a series of panels on trauma-informed workplaces. And I could not be more thrilled at the guests we have joining us today for our conversation on holistic safety. So we'll kick off and let each of our amazing panelists introduce themselves. We'll start with you, Christy. Yeah, Stephanie, so great to be here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Christy Palutic. I am a third generation construction professional and have worked in the industry myself for nearly 20 years. I founded Alta Consulting after working with two of the largest general contractors to really help construction leaders improve their employee experience. So how do we make the experience a little bit better for the folks working in the industry? Because if we can do that, we can make it better for their families in the communities within which we work. Awesome. Thanks, Christy. Colleen. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie. So always an honor to be at the table. So thank you for inviting me. Um, so Colleen Seringer, Fractional Chief Wellbeing Officer, um, founder of Colleen Seringer Consulting. Um, the work that I do really is built around the workplace and well-being. Um, it's, we have a big opportunity at hand to right size what well being actually means in the workplace. Um, I think we found ourselves lending pretty heavy on programs and incentives, um, respecting that, that there's a place for those. Um, there's a much bigger opportunity that well being really has always been about. Um, hence the, the opportunity to serve that role from a, from a fractional standpoint. Amazing. Always great to have you, Colleen. Zeke. Hi, thank you, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. Great to see all the uh, the co-panelists here. Excited to take part. Zeke Smith with Apache Industrial. We're an industrial contractor, so like Christy, uh, in the construction industry. I'm only a second generation construction uh, industry professional, and uh, I currently have the pleasure to serve as our director of learning and workforce development for Apache. So, doing all of our training, including uh, resiliency and mental health training for our uh, employees, which include about 5,000 craft workers. So excited to be here and look forward to the conversation. Amazing. Thank you so much, Zeke. And we were actually talking just before this, and I was singing Zeke's praises, so I'm going to sing it for, for everyone. Zeke, uh, I had a chance to hear him speak um, at, a, at a conference, and he has just such a phenomenal perspective on you know, the workplace, construction, and mental health. So could not be more excited to have you joining us today. And last, but certainly not least, Nick, I'll give it over to you to introduce yourself. Uh, hi, uh, Nick Lemick. Um, I am a uh, captain on the Omaha Fire Department. I'm in charge of the Public Education Division. Um, I am also a co-founder and chief of operations for Elite Tactical Security and Protection. Um, we're located in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, one of the big things that we've been focusing on, um, you know, uh, in, in both of my roles is community risk reduction, safety, public safety. That's always been a big, uh, a big part of, uh, of, of who I am and, and what I think is important. One of the big, big things is it's very difficult um, if you don't feel safe, you know, to do the things you want to do in your life. So that's, that's, that's very important. Absolutely. And full disclosure, it's probably not surprising. Lemmick's not the most common name, but Nick is my older brother. So full, full disclosure there, we'll be transparent. That's, that's another trauma-informed principle. So before we dive into our questions for the panelists, I want to take some time and explain what the concept of holistic safety is. So most of us have probably spoken about safety at work pretty common, but probably we haven't addressed safety holistically or looked at safety as what I like to refer to it as a three-legged stool, where safety really is about physical safety. So the safety of your physical person, occupational safety is included in that, safety and security is included in that, psychological safety. So feeling of that psychological safety and trust at work. And then finally, financial safety. So are you financially safe in both the short and long term? And all three of those things are really that stool of holistic safety when we think about safety for individuals and safety as we tackle it in the workplace. And those of you familiar with stools, if one of those legs is missing, it's not going to stand. So really today, we're going to be looking at 
safety holistically and talking about specifically physical safety, psychological safety, and financial safety. So we'll kick it off with my first question um, for each of the panelists. I would love to hear from each of you, what does safety mean to you? And anyone who wants to kick it off with the answer, feel free to jump in. I'm, I'm happy to jump in. So as when I think about, or when I hear this question, my mind goes to a place that, I don't know, it, it may be an unusual response, but I think that it ties perfectly into like what the kind of the definition of safety typically is. I, I immediately go to freedom from anxiety. So knowing that I'm not going to be injured when I get in my car, when I go for a walk on the sidewalk, um, when I walk into my workplace, and that's from both a physical and a like a mental standpoint. So that that is what consistently comes up for me when I think about that, how I would define safety and its freedom from anxiety. I think I'll go ahead and jump in here to piggyback a little bit on what Colleen had said is that as I as I think about safety, there's all the three legs of the stool, right? But more often than not, when you're feeling safe, you don't even necessarily think about it. It's mm -hmm. when you feel more unsafe, when one leg of that stool is a little wobbly and you sit down or, you know, you fall down. It's that that unsafe feeling that typically comes up that brings that anxiety, that brings that uncertainty, which is exactly where your mind goes. When you have that feeling of safety, you're able to, I mean, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You're able to produce more, do more, think bigger and broader, then bring it right back to that core of that safety piece. Um, and it's really across all three legs of that stool, Stephanie, that you defined. Awesome. Nick, I, think, I saw you wanted to jump in. Yeah. I think um, one of the big things when it comes to safety, it's the uh, it's the balance, uh, the the two Fs. It's it's freedom and fear, right? So those are, those are the two things that a lot of times um, I think drive pretty much most of what we do, a fear or that sense of freedom. And Colleen brought it up, the, the, the freedom, freedom from anxiety, freedom from fear. When you feel safe um, physically, financially, psychologically, there's that freedom, right? That fear is something that's going to handcuff you. It's going to, it's going to hold you down. But when they when you're safe, you're, you know, that, that safe space, you can be yourself. You're free to be yourself, free to go for your goals, free to accomplish the things that you're, you know, that, that you can do. Um, that's, that's a, that's an amazing feeling of safety. You know, I think feel safe, you're free to really reach your potential. Awesome. Zeke, how about you? Sure. I'll bring it home in the spirit of uh, smart brevity here. I, as Stephanie and Christy have heard me talk. I like to talk, so I'm going to try to keep it short because you guys gave great answers. For me, safety is the number one and most paramount human uh, need. Christy mentioned, you know, hierarchy of need, but from needs for me, safety is number one because it, you know, to next point, it motivates us to do or not do everything else. So from an employee or personal standpoint, I think we need to treat it as the number one motivator and from an employer standpoint, treat it as our number one responsibility, right? It's because we're asking for people and then we'll get into this in a minute. We're asking for people to give the company or us, their whole selves. So we are in turn responsible to protect their whole selves. I know we'll get into a, a second. So that probably wasn't as short as I should have been, but anyway. It was really good word. though. It was great. <laughs> um, so Zeke tied up my next question per perfectly. So, you know, we Love talk it when about a plan why, comes together, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so we talked about why safety, what safety is, but why is it so vitally important? in the workplace? What what makes it such an important aspect of any effective, you know, happy trauma-informed workplace? So I, I have a tendency to always like want to go. So sorry, if anyone like really wanted to go, I have a tendency to always want to do that. So, bear with, so for me, what comes up for this is we spend more than half of our waking hours in the workplace. So it better feel safe. That is a lot of time for us doing a job that is taking us away from other things. So that that's for me why it's critical. Amazing. I'll jump in here as well. I think there's a couple things. One, I think it's just the right thing to do, right? I mean, let's make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. And the other side of that coin is, I think it's a business imperative. 
if employees are not feeling safe in the workplace, they're, they're not going to be productive. They're not going to be able to do the work that you need them to do from a business perspective. So again, it, you know, Nick talked about that freedom of fear. If employees have that sense of fear, they're not going to go do the work that you want them to do. So businesses have to ensure that that's taken care of for their employees to go do the work that they want them to go do. And, uh, and, and, and I'd say uh, it, it's it's so important in the workplace. And then I'm, I'm coming from um, from that firefighter perspective. I mean, firefighting is inherently not safe. Right? It's inherently not safe. Right. So if, if you bring it, you know, kind of look from that perspective. OK, well, this is an entire job career. You know, there's several careers where none of this is safe. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but being able to have the training. So everyone's having the safety training. There's all the people that have your back. They're there. They're going through this with you. They're there to help you. We're working as a team all together. So even though something's inherently unsafe, running into a burning building, right? Um, you have all those teammates, all those people um, with your corporation, with your group, with your team that are all there ensuring that things get done the right way. You've trained for this. You've gone through these things together. You've built that coalescence, you know, um, knowing what to do in these situations and there's a feeling of safety because you're with people um that you can trust in and believe in even though you're actually in a very unsafe situation right and so there's that that feeling of safety even when something is this is not safe yeah i love that i was gonna say um first of all nick if you're a firefighter i need you to grow the stash buddy like you need to go ahead and grow my stash. <laughs> All the firefighters in Houston now are growing mustaches. I thought it was a police officer thing, but anyway, sorry, I, but I, I digress. <laughs> no, um, so I'm going to use a lot of construction analogies and examples. That's the industry I've worked in for most of my life, and my dad was in it, and Christy's dad and grandfather um, as well. But I think that running into a burning building is, if you were to weigh it, less safe than construction work, but somehow I believe construction workers are injured more often than firefighters. And so, you know, the why it's important to me is let's just put it on the table. It's costly. And companies have realized that um, and not just costly to the big oil companies and that their billions of dollars. But guess what? When those things go offline because of an injury or an incident or God forbid a death, we're not getting our con you know consumer goods. Right. Supply chain issues as we use so much during the pandemic. So these things are um, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 layers deep when these things happen. So it's costly to business. It may cost jobs, right? It also um, can cost people their own employment if they made a mistake that caused something else. So it, it, it's costly. And also, um, I just think it's interesting that in certain industries, firefighters being tough guys, uh, first responders, construction workers being known as these tough guys. And you know, I've talked to my, my dad a lot and they walked around unharnessed and just walked around and unsafe. My dad actually lost the tip of his finger in a construction accident. And so we've got this reputation of, oh, we don't care about safety, but it's quite the opposite. I think these folks, um, they want to do, they have a lot of pride in their work. And I keep equating to firefighters. I, I have so much respect and very many, a few friends that do that, do that work. So much pride in your work, right? Firefighters is a, is a proud profession, construction workers, same thing. So these folks want to feel safe so they can go do their craft. They want to be able to exhibit. They want to say, I built that. I did that. But if there's safety concerns, they can't do it and they can't do it as well. And by the way, the data is out there. When you're safe, you're more productive. You're more efficient. You're not having to get these things out of the way. It, at first, it was, why are we wasting time stretching and flexing in the mornings? You know, why are we tying off? I have to clip in, then unclip when I'm at elevations. These things seem to be time wasters, but now years later, all the data is showing, well, in fact, they're way more productive. And there's gotta be some connectivity there to the psychological piece of that saying, hey, I'm at a hundred feet up on a scaffold. I'm speaking about my guys and my company, but I know if I fall, I'm going to be caught and they're going to come get me down because there's layers upon layers of safety protocol to prevent that from happening. So I just think it's super interesting that this shift because it wasn't always like that. And there's a famous picture in New York, those guys, the iron workers, right? They're a hundred stories up sitting there having their lunch, you know, and there's guys that used to walk those beams. And I just think that it's a, it's a 
a positive shift and, and, and really interesting to me that how, how much it shifted in some of these different professions and industries. I love specifically, and uh, Nick and Zeke, you both talk about physical, like you're talking about referencing physical safety, how you're doing things that are potentially unsafe and you want these tools, different things, but you also at the same time reference that connection into psychological safety and how psychological safety, those relationships, those teams, those environments really help bolster all of those tools and resources that help kind of that physical person keep safe as well. So I I didn't even tee you guys up for that, but I thought that was amazing. Nick, I saw you were going to say something. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think Zeke's made a, a, a great point too here. Um, I think it's really nice, especially, you know, in the last decade, decade and a half, um, a move away from a toxicity, uh, mm -hmm. a toxic um, mindset. I know, uh, you know, speaking from, you know, the firefighting, um, you know, uh, career path, it used to be the coolest thing. It's like, oh, yeah, I don't need to wear my mask. I can go in there. I need this smoke. Oh, I don't need to clean my gear. I don't need to, you know, I'm tough. Look how salty my gear is. It's all, you know, bat battle hard and all these things, you know, um, because I'm the tough, cool firefighter. And you can see how many fires I've been in by how blackened my helmet is. Well, all that stuff on your helmet gave you cancer. Um, you know, you know, um, not wearing your pro protective gear. Now you breathe, breathe in the smoke. Now you have emphysema. Now you have lung cancer. Now you have all these other things. Um, I think it's really, really good that I've been seeing with this, uh, the, the newer generation of, of people coming into the workforce. It's like, I'm going to make sure that I'm safe so I can do my job effectively. And it's cool, you know, I, not to be like, you know, I'm 40 is like, cool. Um, it's cool to be safe because then we can do our job and be professionals and you can look at me as a professional, not in, not, not an amateur who's, who's going to potentially hurt myself and then put myself in a situation where other people are going to have to take risks to help me. And I think, you know, yeah, with the construction as well, staying safe, you know, taking those risks isn't cool anymore. Yeah. And, and it made safety has become personal. Right. So, yes, you can be a tough firefighter or a tough construction worker or a tough whatever. But you know what's not tough? Your kids and they need their tough dad to come home as a whole person. Right. Or come home at all. And making that. So, I, you know, to your point, Stephanie, I think the physical and psychological and the other you know, mental health and financial health, the total human health aspect, it's connected. It's not let's have a month. September 1st today, suicide prevention month for construction. Like let's. Great. Right. Let's have a stand up and initiative. But what else are we just going to have? This is so and so month this of the year and this is so and so month. OK, got it. Let's what action are we taking? What's the follow up? How do we make that? How do we how do we display that connectivity? Because to me, that's what's important. Right. Making it personal. That's what changed. Just people said, you know, again, I've talked to my dad. So I've got this uh, this old you know, research there, personal research that said, hey, yeah, I, I wanted to come home to my kids and my wife. And I realized that if I kept doing these things, yes, I'm tough, but then I don't work anymore and I'm not tough. I'm sitting at home in a wheelchair or whatever. Right. So um, I, I think whatever that switch was, uh, I'm happy it happened. I just think that over time folks evolved and said it is not that cool to be at home and not be able to have pride in my work. And you know, take whatever disability money from the government or what people aren't, they're not proud to do that overall as, as a, as a, as a whole. So I think that's where it sort of it's flipped a switch for a lot of folks and said, it's, it's cool and smart and just the right thing to do. Like you said, Christy, to be safe and make sure others around me are also safe in all capacities. And I know we're going to get more into that. Well, I think just, if I could just add one thing, cause I love where you're coming at from again, construction, <clears throat> fire, police, right? Like things that when we look at them, they are, it's a risk, right? But I think when you then flip that to kind of your traditional white collar at the office, I think that's also shifted to, I want to come home, not burned out. So I can also, right, be present for my family. So I think you all just hit on such important things that 100% we can see it right in these industries that we were just talking about and but love that that shift is also taking place in kind of your, you know, butt in the chair job as well. I need to come home and not burned out. I need to be fully present when I'm at home. 
and Colleen, that's awesome point. I'm glad you went there because I think that's something that doesn't get talked about in the frontline workers or the craft workers because they think we all they do, like to your point, Stephanie, they think physical safety. I got to make sure I'm, you know, no limbs broken, no cuts, no burns. I'm going home as a whole person. But they may not be because they are burned out because they just did a 12 hour shift or yeah. were at the station for 13 days trader with us. We do sometimes 13 ones, right? 13 days on one day off. And let's not forget something we all do every day is we drive, which is inherently also unsafe and risky. And if we're burnt out, tired, distracted, injured in any, any sort a very dangerous practice is just trying to get home. Right. It depends on where you live. I mean, Houston, you know, so, um, so I just think that's a it's a fantastic point, but that is something that I'm I'm very proud of. And I know Nick's probably been a part of this as well in the first responder world is they're starting to talk about that piece with our traditional kind of craft workers that do things with their hands, um, as opposed to just the physical safety piece of their saying, hey, these we're working these people too hard. They are broken down physically, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. What are we gonna do about it now? Because it, sorry, one other thing, it does become, so my husband, he's, he owns a construction business. I come from a construction background too. I always say I bleed blue, bleed blue collar. <laughs> but he, anytime a guy comes maybe after a night of, you know, binge drinking or whatever happens after work, it does become his problem the next day if that person is not firing on every single mental health cylinder, right? And so now, now it's a potential unsafe environment for everyone. So I, I just, again, I, I just, so much from that, that mental health piece is also a part of, it is the employer's problem and we have to continue to put thoughts and efforts around it. Well, and I think that one of the things that Colleen and Zeke, you guys are talking about specifically is that when it comes to safety, a lot of employers, you know, in the past, I'm not quite sure where it shifted, but in the past, there's always a Okay, you need to be safe at work for these reasons, right? And here's what we're going to do to keep you safe while you're inside these four walls. I've really seen that conversation shift to talking about safety more holistically and looking at the whole person, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's construction, okay, holiday lights that you might be putting on your house. How do you make sure that you're maintaining safety doing that? Or you're going home and, and binge drinking. How do you, you know, being careful with that? The burnout, right? How do we in more of that that white collar space or the non-craft space how do we help keep our folks safe you know holistically and mentally and you know for those that are struggling with trauma at home whether it's an individual or family members there's a partner support that impacts a person and they bring that to work so i think i've started to see that shift in conversations around safety in the workplace is that it's no longer just about those four walls that you you know you spend your day in or construction site whatever space that is it's bridging that gap and, and it's broadening the conversation, I think all for the better, because it's not just between the hours of, you know, seven to five or whatever hours people yeah. work, right? Yeah. It's it's bigger than that. So Chris, Chris, perfect, perfect Chris. thing to, oh, go ahead, Nick, what were you gonna say? I was, I was gonna say, Christy, Christy is, is so right in this. Um, I'm, I'm lucky enough to, uh, to be on a fire department that's been really, really proactive um, with obviously, you know, wear your helmets, wear your PPE, those kind of things. Um, but first responders um, see a lot of things that can be pretty terrible um, and things that you go home and then you close your eyes and then you get to relive that. You know, um, we've had um, we've had firefighters that have worked for uh, for the Omaha Fire Department that have, you know, um, lost their battles with depression, um, you know, um, yeah. and that's something that's been really, really great on the Omaha fire department is that the administration here has realized, yes, wear your helmet. Yes. Wear your PPE. That is not the holistic safety. That is not, that doesn't your, just your physical body is, does not encompass everything that's safe. You know, uh, we've been able to put in peer support teams, peer support teams that I've used after something's bothered me. And it's not necessarily a call. Maybe it's something going on at home, but peer support teams where it's another firefighter, that you come and have a confidential talk with um, to be able to help you so you can be better and then be a better firefighter, which I think that's that's a huge thing. It's it's moving forward in the first responder community. I'd love to see that really move forward in, 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 in all industries because I think it's something where um, it's worth the resources that you put into it. But now all of a sudden, you know, you don't just have half of an employee. 
employee that shows up and gets the job. You have someone who is like, I'm here. I'm supported here. You know, they care about me, not just as, you know, do your job, do your job. They care about me because I'm a human being and I'm a person. And that's when, 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 uh, when your employer makes you feel like that, they care about me as a person, all of a sudden, um, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to be a better employee. You, you just are, you know, there's, there's a lot. Sometimes people want to come to work to get away from some of those home demons, right? Because work is such a safe place. And I mean, safe in all the contexts we've discussed. So let's not forget that. That's a great point. That's fantastic. So we're talking about this expansive view of safety. So how do we drive a more expansive view of safety, that holistic safety, that safety beyond the walls of work in organizations? How do we drive that to shift that focus to really encompass physical, psychological, and financial safety for our teams? So I, is, oh, sorry, Colin, go ahead. No, 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 you go. You go. I'll go after you. I promise you go. <laughs> All good. I think just to piggyback on what I shared earlier, I think we're starting to see that happen more and more. And I think it needs to continue to evolve and continue to, to grow. That said, if we sit back and just wait for it organically to happen, I mean, come on, it'll happen. Sure. But we can do more. Um, and I think there's multiple things around that of, you know, getting leadership buy-in, getting active voices in an organization, whether that comes from leadership, admittedly leadership, the ones that hold the purse strings have to get bought in because chances are it's going to take time, money to support that. But it's having those active voices speak up in the organization saying, hey, this is important and something we need to do here. How do we go ahead and make that happen? And it's pulling in sometimes even free resources. If folks have a 401k program, they can bring in someone to help talk about financial wellness and safety and what does that look like from a future planning. And there's other things that can be done around that as well to make it deliberate and make it intentional. All right, Colleen. No, no, thank you. I love that. So where my mind was going is, and I always want to be, you know, super sensitive and mindful is so that when, when I think about, yes, COVID brought us some extremely terrible experiences and outcomes, right? But it also brought some positivity um, to, for me specifically on, in my nerdy world, social determinants of health is a really big thing, right? It's a population health word. It's finally finding its way, I think, more and more in the workplace as we're talking about the whole person. And so for me, that's a thank you, COVID, because that's the direction that we can maybe try to help folks understand when we're talking about this whole person if we look at them really from what impacts the health of a human, it is not that they're eating poorly. Like we immediately go for the bad stuff, right? The lifestyle. When we forget that we come from maybe a low income or my education is limited or the community that I live in doesn't have a safe sidewalk or my religious background or ethnic, you know, there's, there's all these components that make the person the person and impact behavior. So for me, I immediately go to if we can continue to fold social determinants of health, social determinants of mental health, that's a whole nother concept. If we can continue to tap into that, that can help us drive this conversation holistically from a safety standpoint. That's incredible. You like blew our minds. <laughs> right. We got a whole other conversation on that. Yeah, that's what <laughs> we are. We, like, like we're going to call you later. I have, I have, I have follow up questions. For sure. Yeah, amazing. I love it. But to shift now, let's talk a little bit. We've had such great conversation so far. I really appreciate it. But one thing I found is the term psychological safety has gotten kind of sexy. Like people are talking about psychological safety at work a lot more, um, especially in, you know, the more white collar type environments where maybe physical safety hasn't become, you know, as prominent. It's not as prominent um, just because of the type of work. So I'd love from here, I'd love to hear from all of you, you know, what are the key components or elements when you think of building psychological safety? I'm letting someone else go first. <laughs> I could jump in, but I'm going to let someone I'll, else go I'll first. go first because I went last couple of times. So I'll, I'll <laughs> I, I will say, um, Stephanie, to your first couple of points, yes, the word has emerged from out of nowhere. Yeah. 
in a good way. Uh, it was a word in, you know, the Adam Grant books and things like that for a while. And that's, that's where it, it, it stayed. So i um, proud of that. And I do think I've spoken with Christy at length before about just having these conversations repeatedly and, and dedicating yourself to not giving up to having the conversations, right? If someone, if you get resistance, not saying, okay, well, that's a, a dead topic and goes into the black hole of new initiatives, like everything else that we try to change around here. Right. So I think that's the persistence of it is very important that you're going to keep talking about it. You say, no, this is not something we're doing. As I said before, once a month, this is what we do here. Um, but I do think most importantly, at least for, for our workforce, language matters. And so coming out of the gate and we, I dealt with this with the term mental health, to be fair. And that's a word that's used every day, all day, all the time. But we had resistance to that in our industry, right? Saying that term. And so psychological safety is the same thing, second iteration. Um, so I think it's it's come, it, it's talking about it in different ways languages right different different styles saying okay what is this term what does this term mean to you it means hey we want you to speak up the way i've translated it for our folks is guess what in safety we've had stop work authority for 15 years guess what stop work authority is psychological safety it's giving the first day employee the apprentice the 18 year old kid on a job site the same authority to say hey this looks weird it doesn't look safe. We should stop. I need to ask a question without fear of retribution or termination or worse. Right. So if we can find the common ground of existing our existing work processes, they're there um, and connect the language. I think that is super powerful because then you start to talk on their terms, not on our terms. Folks are on a wounded workforce, you know, podcast type situation. So we're supposed to talk like this. My scaffold builders or a brand new, uh, you know, firefighter probably don't talk like that. And no. so finding that point of connection is really, really important as far as language. And I think the mental health that goes is, you know, stress and burnout. Colleen said burnout. We use that. Distraction is a mental health issue, right? You're distracted, you're less safe. So finding those connection points, I think, is extremely important, if not paramount, paramount to making change. I think to add on to what Zeke is talking about is how do we find those connections? As I've heard psychological safety, I've heard so often, it's about bringing your whole self to work. And I disagree with that. I might, you know, piss a few people off. It's not the first time, probably gonna happen again. But I don't think it's about bringing your whole self to work. If I get hangry, I am crabby, I am rude, I am short, no one wants to be around me. That's part of my whole self. But it's not about, you know, feeling comfortable bringing that to work. To me, being psychological safe is about bringing your best self to work, right? The ability to challenge, you know, folks like Zeke talked about, right, with that stop work authority. But how do you bring your best self, the curious, the inquisitive, the willing to go do it, kind, caring, supportive? How do you feel safe to bring that? And again, to piggyback on what Zeke said, without that fear of retribution, right? Without that fear of being judged for who your best self is, I deserve to be judged when I'm hangry, right? Like, I, admittedly, just just give me a cookie and a <laughs> hug, I'll be fine. <laughs> it's about how do we bring that best self to work when we're feeling psychologically safe? I I, I love. Oh, sorry. sorry. I'm I'm team don't bring your whole self to work either. Maybe it's the many years in HR, Christy, but like don't I, we can't bring expect to bring every aspect of ourself everywhere. And so I love what you say your best self sometimes instead I will say bring your genuine self to work. Yeah. You don't have to bring it all, but at least what you're bringing forward is that best version or that genuine version. So I, I'll co-sign that with you so people can be mad at us together. And I'll plus oh, one. Gonna <laughs> I was okay. That's exactly where I was going. I'm like, I'm plus one for best. There are some things you do not need to see from me. <laughs> but I, I also then second exactly what Zeke and Christy were saying, that it is about like knowing that I am going to receive fair treatment, right? Or that like I'm surrounded by relationships that I know I can trust. Um, that if I do say something like, hey, this doesn't feel safe, I'm not going to then be like, well, that guy, I mean, when we were older, you know, we weren't, 
we were hanging by a string or whatever, you know, like, so to me, it's about being confident and comfortable to, to stand up for yourself um, in maybe situations that don't work for you. But I think you have to have, you have to know that there's fair treatment and high trust. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to come out and, and I'm not angry at anyone. Um, <laughs> just so everyone knows. Um, I, I've never gotten angry ever actually. Um, but uh, so, <laughs> So, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some skepticism. Hey, leave this man's Oreos alone. That's all I have to say. Oh, geez. don't eat my Oreos. Uh, well, all right. that's, that's, that's a whole, that's a whole other, that's a whole other presentation, the Oreo incident. Um, and we can, we can work through that, the psychological impact of that later. But, um, but um, what I think what's interesting and, and I think, um, you know, um, coming from, my career path with the fire department, I think I have a little bit of a unique perspective in the fact that um, when we go to work, we don't go to work from nine to five, we go to work for a 24 hour period. Um, mm -hmm. And, 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 and we work in, and, and we, so they call it a firehouse because it's literally a house where we live for a third of our lives, you know? And, and I think it's one of those things like, and, and I understand kind of the difference, like bring your whole self to work, bring your best self to work. Um, I, I really, I actually like that. Bring your genuine self to work. Um, I think that's a really good, a really good um, way to put it. Especially if you're looking at a, a situation. I mean, it could be a military where you're on a deployment. It could be, you know, fire department where you have that 24 hours where you are there and they're your guys and you live together. You're going to eat together. Um, you're going to uh, work on whatever emergency happens together. You're going to, you know, uh, sleep. You know, you, you know, you 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 go to you go to uh, bed at night. Um, hopefully maybe, maybe not. Um, but, um, I think it's one of those things where if you can bring your genuine self, right, a person there and you're willing to, you don't have to open up everything about your entire life with the, with, with everyone, but opening enough where you can see that you're invested in the team invested together. You don't have to tell everyone every problem you have. Some people do, you know, but, uh, but, but you don't, you don't have to, um, but, but you can, you can open up a little more than that whole, like, here I am, I'm doing this, I'm doing this and I'm the best, you know, you know, um, you, you can, you're not just, you're not just your job. Right. And, and, and if, if I think if the people that you work with understand, it's like, this is not just Stephanie from HR, this is not just Nick from, you know, from, from, from the fire engine. Right. And it's like, this is, you know, there's, there's more to it. There's more. Uh, there's more colors in the paintings your entire life, you know, than just, just that one job. I think that's something that people will appreciate. And I think it helps improve the workplace and that we can see, oh, there's, there's more than just this job here to us. We don't have to paint the entire picture for everyone, but I think sharing some of that um, with each other really builds those bonds. And I think it improves, uh, improves the workplace. Yeah, That's Nick, great. just to piggyback a little bit on that as well, is that sometimes bringing your best self, right? After a full night's sleep, everything's going well at home with your family, right? Your mental health, your physical health, you've got an exercise in the morning, your best self's like killing it, right? 10 out of 10. Sometimes you're struggling, right? Sometimes your best self is a, is a 6 out of 10, right? And But yeah. it's doing the best you can and, and sharing some of that vulnerability of, hey, I'm not a hundred percent today because I've got some stuff going on, right. To share that vulnerability, but Hey, let's go do the best we can do today. And having that safety to be able to share some of that within the workplace, right. And outside of the workplace, right. Yeah. With our families as well. Sometimes the best self. Yeah. It's not a 10 out of 10. Sometimes, yeah. you know, it's doing the best you can in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So, Let's, so just to think, you know, a little bit tactically for those listening who want to assess or understand how their organization or how their team is doing as it relates to safety, how can organizations, teams, leaders measure or assess the three dimensions of safety effectively or just safety overall for their organization? Yeah, I, I immediately go to conversation. Um, so I really kind of go to three things. I go to employee feedback. We have to talk to our people like surveys. I would put those number three. Sure. Do the surveys, do the assessments, do the standard stuff. But just like going to the doctor, 
your people can tell you about 80% of what's missing if you actually are asking and having a conversation, just like you're, you're telling your doctor 80% of your problem and then, then they're finishing the 20 with the rest. So I, I think feedback sessions and of course, observations, I mean, workplace observation. And I know we can't be everywhere um, all the time, but we certainly can spot check. We certainly can spend more time with boots on the ground. And I just think that there's there's obviously some places that that makes more sense than others. But I think even if you had to take it to Zoom, observe the way people are interacting with each other. How is one conversation when X person is on the call versus not on the call? How did the dynamic shift? I just I think I think we've gotten so far away from some just common connection with humans. Um, so those are those are kind of my my go tos. And then, of course, you could always survey and assess and all that good stuff. But. I think the first two are more important. I'm going to highlight a little bit your number three around the surveys piece. I think that there's some incidence rates and some data and stuff like that, again, coming yeah. from the construction space. But Colleen, I worked with a client here last year where yeah, I actually dug in around the surveys. And one of the questions we asked was around, do you feel comfortable sharing a concern or a dissenting position without fear of retribution, essentially? Mm -hmm. And on the overall, right, the peanut butter view is, yeah, it's pretty much fine. But what we did is we dug into the layers and started looking at the intersectionality within that, within the organization. And very specifically with this client, we saw very different populations with very different responses. Yeah. Right. So things that could have been observed in a, in a call or in person, but this way we had that data to be able to back it up to say, hey, by the way, this group, super comfortable. Yeah. This group over here, not comfortable at all, right? Yeah. Something's happening from an inclusive leadership perspective where voices aren't comfortable being heard in that situation. And sharing that with the leaders are like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Thank you. Now let's again start to dig into this a little bit better. But it's being careful, right? What's the peanut butter saying on the top and then digging into those layers underneath? Well, I appreciate that you said that because that was, I mean, I think that's the big opportunity that's often forgotten is survey, high level survey data is one thing, but when you start to hone in, right, by division, department, what shift, whatever it is, that tells a whole different story. So yeah, rolling up your sleeves and getting gritty in that data, is, there's so many stories that can come out of it. So I love that you said that. Yeah. Amazing. Great yeah, ideas. I would, Great. I take a little bit. No, sorry. Um, so I, I also love surveys and data, but I think based on where we are with this topic in the workplace, I almost want to take a step back a bit because I'm thinking back again, when we had this physical safety shift years ago in industry, right? Did they take surveys of employees and say, do you feel unsafe? Or did they say, okay, we think it's the right thing to do. And it's just costly, these injuries, and maybe we should try to preserve life and put some protocols and process in place. Well, the data is showing us today that this is an issue across the board, across industry, across gender, race, culture, it's an issue, right? It's also showing us that companies aren't doing enough today. So there's your, there's your survey data. And I'm not, I, again, I think employee engagement surveys and so forth are important. We have physical safety data at our fingertips all the time, but we don't have the other topics, right? The other legs of the stool. So I think we should take a, an approach to say this is an issue and let's go further than make sure we provide support and resources and let's start training our people to deal with these issues just like we train them to be safe, physically safe on a job site, right? So Nick probably trains his new guys that come in, his cadets, how to be safe and not get burnt or not, you know, how to spot something unsafe and make the call. We do that with our apprentices as well. We're training them on physical safety. So why aren't we training them? Hey, we know you're going to deal with something financially, emotionally, spiritually, mentally on the job or at home. But Christy, I think you said this earlier, but it's not our problem. Maybe we're the cause of it, but you just, that's your deal. Go home and deal with it. I just, I, I don't accept that answer. I think we need to bring it back upstream and say, Chances are their manager, our culture, or lack thereof, the work that we're doing is maybe a cause of some of these issues. And we should train these folks on how to be more resilient, get in their face a bit, just like we do with the physical safety. So expanding that, right? And we joke about, oh, yeah, people aren't going to care about having a, you know, meditating or having a mental health, you know, breathing exercise. It's like, yeah, but you know what? Five years ago, 
they were making fun of us for doing stretch and flex every morning on a construction mm -hmm. site. We had a bunch of big burly guys doing this and all this junk, but now they do it every day and our customers now require it. So I think that if we start as leaders in industry to do that and say, look, let's, let's just take the stance that this is a problem. And it may not be a problem that every person in every company, but across the board, it's a problem. So we need to start training our folks how to deal with it better. And that's our approach. And that's non-negotiable. That's what we do here is we train our folks how to deal with all these issues within safety, not just the one leg. I love that. I love that. We have one question left. Uh, this has been such an amazing conversation. We could talk for way more hours. Um, but I would love for each of you, if you could share, if someone is interested in learning more about safety or just diving a little bit deeper into anything we've talked about, is there a book, article, podcast, any other kind of piece of media, anything you would recommend for folks to take a look at, to dive, more, dive in and learn more about safety? So I'm a big fan of, I think, I mean, Zeke, you mentioned Adam Grant. I'm a big fan of his um, work-life podcast. It, is it specific to safety? No. But I think if you listen, if you listen beyond like the context that's provided, it's there. There's a lot of what he's getting at is, is getting at just mental health in general, right? And then other kind of aspects of safety. And so that's always my kind of go-to when I'm out and about is listening to his work. Thanks, Colleen. I think for me and Stephanie, I think you actually listed it as one of your books uh, to recommend. It's What Happened to You by Oprah Winfrey and Bruce Perry. Again, not entirely directly safety, but it's really around shifting that conversation from what's wrong with you yeah. to what happened to you. Talk again about building that resilience seek that you talked about. And it's understanding yourself, right, from a trauma-informed space, but also those around you, right? How to identify things, how to be able to create that more psychologically safe space for those around you as well as, well as yourself in the space. So huge fan, just finished it not that long ago. So what happened to you? Great book. Mm -hmm. What you got, Nick? Backdraft? Oh, it's a good one. <laughs> All right, so... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so there's a couple things and some of them might seem a little out of the ordinary with with this right so obviously i recommend that everyone um sus subscribe to all of stephanie's things the wounded workforce um, number one um, proud bro yeah. moment right there I know. I love that. I'm, very, I'm very proud of um another another um author that i've found a lot of inspiration from is jocko willink um, he's a Navy SEAL. He ended up forming a, 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 a motivational company um, and getting all that, um, the dichotomy of leadership. I think that's a great, and I mean, so there's going to be some of like the Navy SEAL stuff, uh, you know, some of that military, so some action pack type of stuff, but also that dichotomy of leadership about, um, you know, when you're in that leadership role, you're making these decisions that affect all these other people. Um, and I think that's important for employers, leaders in the business community, leaders of any organization to help understand, here's all these people and you have a responsibility to them as well to make sure that they're okay, you know, physically, you know, mentally, there, there, there's all these different pieces that, that work together, you know, and it doesn't just have to be because you're in, doing an invasion, um, you know, it, it, it can be in, in the boardroom be on the fire ground, or it can be on the construction site. It can be in all, or, you know, in all these different places. Um, the other one is you're probably going to laugh. Um, it's a, it's, it's a podcast. They're about five minutes long. Um, and they're from Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, it's called Arnold's pump club. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I know, I know I they're it. about five. <laughs> the, the, one, one comes out every single day and it's a great way, you know, depending on how long your commute is, it's probably not less than five minutes, but it's a five minute little, Hey, we're building a positive part of the world here. Um, here's some stuff on how you're, you can sleep better. Here's a breathing exercise. Here's something, you know, uh, make sure, you know, in the morning it's eating some carbohydrates. You know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a five minute little boost for the day that you can do this, you know, in that wonderful Arnold Schwarzenegger voice is like, you're going to do it, you know, um, <laughs> but also gives you some great tips about some breathing, you know, the, uh, like today's he talked about the four, seven, eight breathing exercise right? To help mm -hmm. you uh, reduce anxiety, get better rest, you know? Um, 
which you wouldn't think it's like, oh, here's an Arnold Schwarzenegger um, podcast, five minutes long. Listen to it on the way to work. Helps pump you up for the. It helps pump me up for the day, and also hits me with a couple tips how to sleep better. You know uh, how to make sure that I'm setting goals for myself, even if the goal for today was getting out of bed and reaching down and touching my toes. And now I've moved my body for the day. You know, it, and I think setting those goals, those kind of things, it's it's they're important. So yeah, Arnold Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, I brought I That's brought it awesome. In. I love it. I, I don't think anyone's ever recommended that before. So 10 out of 10. Zeke, yeah. close this out. You have to you have to finish after Arnold's work. No, I mean, I, I, so. I, uh, I lost the pool, the things we wouldn't hear on this uh, session today. You know, <laughs> Arnold, I, I, I didn't expect it. But no, I'm, I, you've got a listener now. Um, and I have longer than a five minute commute as well. So I've got a couple and most of them are podcasts, but all based on authors. So first one that's we didn't dive deep into financial wellness as a topic, but most folks know who Dave Ramsey is and there's the Ramsey-ites, if you will. So his stuff is always good, but he has a, uh, an employee of his company, Dr. John Deloney, who's fantastic, um, is a psychiatrist by trade, but his podcast is awesome. His books are really good um, talking about in the workplace and a lot of psychological safety, uh, mental health, emotional and spiritual safety. So he is fantastic connects with people extremely well and he's from texas so i'm slightly biased but nonetheless um he is great if you guys don't know uh, the show homes on homes mike holmes the big canadian yeah. home builder construction guy uh he has a podcast it's mostly about work stuff but he does work shortages he does safety he talks about mental health a little bit so he's had his own run-ins with that which is great and then lastly a population that we didn't really discuss a lot of but i know there's a uh, certainly in the first responder community as well as construction is our veteran community mm -hmm. and so there's a fantastic veteran podcast that's called mentors for military mm -hmm. that i listen to a lot and it basically brings on guys who transitioned out some who struggled mightily with what we're talking about and we have the wounded workforce and the wounded warriors and in, in all aspects and they talk a lot about how to make that transition um how to make yourself safe so you can put your whole self or best self or most authentic self to the into the workplace. I think is important. So those are some ones that are on my regular playlist that are good and helpful and get me pumped up for the day, you know, so. <laughs> amazing, amazing. I cannot thank each of you enough for joining us today. I knew this would be a phenomenal conversation and somehow it still exceeded my expectations. So thank you all so much. Um, Again, if you're interested in learning more about trauma-informed workplaces, make sure and go to thewoundedworkforce.com and subscribe for updates and check out our next panel, which will be on trust and transparency. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much.